Big D. All right, we're I would we have started the broadcast here, guys. So just so we know. Oh man. What do you got the toque on backwards for? Not backwards, it's it's a beret. Oh, well. It's it's take go after dark. I mean, look at Dave, bill? he's got an ascot. Where's the bill of the beret? Should I go get mine? The well, yeah, I think so. I think I I I, right. I would say Dave, our group would like to see that. <laughs> welcome all, welcome, yes. Cocktails and all. No smoking jackets though. No smoking jackets, but I do have a quarantini. <laughs> Cheers. John, do you have Cheers. a drink? <laughs> I well, I'm just drinking Gatorade actually. Well, that'll work. I've got that'll a work. ginger ale and vodka as an ode to John Prime. Good man, good man, good man. I don't know if you can hear him in the background. We got a little bit of John Prime playing. Who left us today? I thought I heard John oh, yeah. in the background. So he was a what a what a great singer and songwriter. But uh, yes, he yeah, will be missed. He will be missed. Jim De Palma says, "What the hell?" <laughs> What? It's Takeo after dark. That's the hell. That's well, it, next direction going on. Dave, all you're right. all uh, spiffy, man. Is that a like a? Yeah, man. Is that a? That is a smoking coat? jacket. Yeah, he's got a smoking jacket Close on. To That's right. Close to it. Close to it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Luckily, yeah. he doesn't smoke anymore. <laughs> That's right. Well, that he's he, but right. he still kept right. the jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I got to do one more thing here. Hold on one second. Okay. There we go. That light was uh, kind of in the way. All righty. Very good. Very good. So we've got quite a crew out here. We got 43 coming in. Uh, so we got about, about four minutes to go time. So excellent. Very good. Very good. Anything exciting awesome. going on in... In uh, Mechanical Hub World this week, Eric, Tim, and John. Well, not a whole lot on my end. JP, how about you? Oh, well, we're just, um, you know, keeping busy with the, the daily routine and, you know, with stuff changing, you know, the dynamic and the, the game per se has changed a little bit. So trying to adjust to that and, kind of working different hours, the family's home. So um, just juggling <laughs> a lot of different things. <clears throat> yeah, it's been kind of like that uh, it, uh, there? on our end too. Just we, Actually, I don't know about, I talk about the other guys. I've been, it's, this, this, this has been a very different kind of busy for us uh, to, to, to the point of where you know, we, we've been online almost, almost continuously for about two and a half weeks now. Yeah, I, I was saying that earlier to somebody that I feel like I'm, I don't know if I'm more busy, but still keeping as busy or maybe busier. Just, you know, a different a different uh, dynamic for sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, same here. It's, uh, you know, we're just finding ways to meet up with uh, our people that we normally do. I mean, our jobs as as the trainers is, hey, let's put groups of people together. And of course we can't do that now. So. Um, this is the be next best way to do it and, and yeah, still exactly. stay in contact with everybody and try to do as, as much as we can. Yep. That's, that has definitely been our, 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 our mode of operation again for the last two, last two and a half weeks, just how many people, people can we, can we reach during the day and working with our reps and wholesalers and, and other customers. We, uh, we had 440 people on a webinar yesterday, so that was kind of a new record for wow. us too. Wow. Impressive. Yeah, it's, it's been it, it, it's been like that. It's been like that. So anyway. Well, I know you're kind of shy. How do you keep up with all these webinars? Well, I, like I've told you last week, John, my only marketable skill is the ability <laughs> to talk nonstop for two and a half to three straight days without getting bored or tired. If I can't do this, I really can't do much of anything. All right. So this is just going this is just playing to my strengths. You know, if you wanted me to, if if it, if if I had to sing and dance during this time, that just wouldn't work at all. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah I hear you. All right. 
We're so still I filling could... in with people here, so still yeah. rocking and rolling. Everyone's mad dash on that login after dinner and stuff on the, especially here on the East Coast. So there we go. Thirty-five to go. Nine. Yep. Oh, yeah, you got some love for the ascot. <laughs> and and Anthony, we go. I, got this. I think a bond <laughs> would be more appropriate. Anthony, did you have to go there? <laughs> did you have to go there? <laughs> uh, the 70s were a lot of fun, weren't they, boys? <laughs> uh, here you go, get one. Love your outfit, JD. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, my man. Hey, mm -hmm. you, you notice what's right above my head there, right? I see you, Mike. Hugh Hefner there in the middle. Hey, that stuff's been sitting in the closet for a long time. Might as well use it now. And there you go. <laughs> All right, are we uh, we're here at seven o'clock? So I, I'm going to suggest we get this show on the road. What do you guys think? Let's go. All righty, let's do it. Let's, let's do it. All right. Um, well, welcome everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us again for, se for session number two of Takeo After Dark. And we're going to talk about heat emitters tonight. And uh, um, I'm John Barba with Takeo, and I'm joined by my, my esteemed and distinguished colleagues, Dave Holdorf and Rick Mayo. And uh, also from Parts Unknown, we have the Mechanical Hub team, John Messenbrink uh, and, and Eric Oni are out there, as well as Tim. You guys want to say hello? Hello, everybody. How how is everyone tonight? Hope everyone's still good. Very good, very good. Eric is Eric is is, is disturbingly quiet, which is a good thing, I guess. <laughs> hey now, hey now. Hey, hey Hello. now, hey now. There you are. <laughs> I had to unmute myself. Well, that, that, that's that's it's good that you know how to self mute. That's a good thing. <laughs> um, thanks again for joining us. A, a couple of things, guys. I want to for the for the team out there, for the listeners out there. Um, Treat this class. We said this last week before, but treat this program as you would a uh, as you would any classroom exercise, because it's a webinar. It it is easy for everyone here to uh, to 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 kind of yeah you're going to zone out. You're going to tune out a little bit, right? You're going to check Facebook or check your email or do something while this, and then all of a sudden we become our voices become like the grown-ups on Charlie Brown. You know, it's going to be wah 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 wah, and you're going to miss out on some of the stuff that we're going to share with you. And it winds up being a you know a not so great use of your time. So do me a favor, get a pad of paper and a pen, and just pretend we're in a classroom and you're taking notes. Write stuff down. That's a that's that's really the best thing that I think you folks can do. Also, in addition, I do as as last week, I do encourage you to ask questions. An awful lot of you folks have already found out how to do that, but there's on your control panel you should see a little cartoon balloon kind of thing. And uh, and that's how you ask questions. So do me a favor, everybody out there, just click on that and type in a question, or just type in a hi, hello, how are you? Uh, if you could do that for me, that would be that would be awesome. And that way, we'll I know I know that you know how to do it, and I know that you know how that you can hear me. That's even better. Very good. All right. So all this is all this is working. So terrific, terrific, terrific. All righty, all righty. So let's get this show on the road again. Tonight's topic is. We're focused on heat emitters and sizing and all that other fun stuff. But let's start with a real quick recap of last week's session. We went over heat loss, how to conduct a very simple hydronics heat loss. So we went through infiltration heat loss. We went through conduction heat loss. We showed you the two formulas and we shared with you a, a download that had a, a nice booklet that you could use to, 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 to figure out all, how all this stuff worked. We talked about U values and outdoor design temperatures and all that fun stuff. And we did, uh, we conducted a manual heat loss for a one room, one, a, a single room heat loss. And we started with infiltration. We came up with 2,268 uh, BTUs. The windows, the walls, there were no, there was no floor or ceiling loss in this particular room. So we came up with a heat load of this one room of 4,022 BTUs. And then we quick did the rest of the house, and we came up with a heat load of 78,000. Uh, same, well, the rest of the house was 78,379 for a total. BTUH required of 82,401. So that's the total BTU load that we had that we have to deal with. When we go about sizing our boiler, that's one of the things we're obviously going to look at. 
from this point on, now we're going to look at, we're going to use that one room number, 4,022 BTUs, and we're going to look at what we might do for heat emitters and understanding things. Baseboard, we think baseboard is simple, all right? And that's actually where we're going to start off. We think baseboard's simple, right? 500 BTUs per foot, 550 BTUs per foot, whatever our favorite number from our favorite brand is. But you do need to look at it a little bit more deeply than that because there's some interesting things that we overlook about baseboard that, that are in the spec sheets. And then there's some interesting things we can do with baseboard or if we have a house that's heated with baseboard and we have to replace the boiler, there's some interesting things we can do when we replace the boiler. So we're gonna look at these, these things over the next few minutes. What we're looking at right here is a baseboard output ratings chart. And this comes from uh, Sterling. This is their Petite 7 baseboard rating. Now normally, and type this in if you think, normally everybody goes right to that 550 BTUs per foot or 500 BTUs per foot uh, or whatever it is when they're talking about fin to baseboard. And then you say, okay, what water temperature are we talking about? What supply water temperature are we talking about? And the number you're gonna get almost immediately is 180 degrees. Well, okay, depending upon the brand of baseboard you're looking at, that 500 or 550 number may or may not be accurate. When we talk about supply water temperature, all too often, if someone's looking at a, at a chart like this, they're gonna say, okay, what's my output at 180 degrees? And what they'll do is they'll look right here, 180 degrees, and they'll see uh, an output of either 600 BTUs per foot or 570 BTUs per foot, whether my flow rate is four gallons per minute or one gallon per minute through that baseboard. Huh, well, which one do I use? Well, if your supply water temperature is 180 degrees, I would submit to you that you would use neither, all right? Please take a look at the top portion of this chart. It's amazing the things you can learn by reading. This is the, 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 the top line in this chart, IBR hot water ratings for circulation based on 65 degree air temperature. The second line is BTU per linear foot of active length of a, active length at an average water temperature, average water temperature. So these numbers are average water temperatures. If we're talking about a 180 degree supply water temperature to that fin tube baseboard, and we have designed it, or we are designing it to the industry standard of 20 degrees worth of delta T or a 20 degree temperature drop, the water's going out at 180, coming back at 160 for an average water temperature of 170. So we really need to be looking at that line and not that one, all right? So is it a big difference? Oh, I don't know. Let's look at this a little bit further. Now we look and we see that there are two lines here for flow rate, gallons per minute flow rate at four gallons a minute or at one gallon a minute. Well, how the heck are we supposed to know which one of those to use? Well, let's take a look. It, the notes down at the bottom, really interesting things you can find out here. Go right to number six, all right? And that says the IBR ratings at four gallons per minute should not be used unless the flow rate is known to be equal to or greater than four gallons per minute. When the flow rate is unknown, the IBR rating at one gallon per minute must be used. So here, we're, let's take a look at this. If we look at this the wrong way and we say, okay, 180 degrees, 600 BTUs per foot, that's darn good baseboard. I'm gonna use that. I get more output at 180, I get 600 BTUs per foot. And in, in reality, we really should be looking at this number, 510, all right? That's only 90 BTUs per foot, but another way of looking at it, that's about 20% less output per foot of baseboard. So you may, you may not have an issue. This stuff tends to be fairly forgiving, but at least it's good to be precise and to know what it is you're looking at, okay? Another interesting tidbit that, that'll be surprising to take if you take a look at this, the, the upper chart is for what they call P77A assembly with three quarter inch element. And the, the lower chart is for P75A assembly with half inch element. If you take a look at the two outputs, you will find that the half inch element, in fact, has greater BTU per foot output than the three quarter inch element. Well. Everything about this says this does not compute. How can you get more output out of a three quarter inch element baseboard than, or how do you get more output out of a half inch element baseboard than you do out of a three quarter inch element baseboard? That doesn't make any sense. Well, again, we have to understand baseboard and we have to look at the notes. 
numbers three and four. Number three says the heating element P7E is three quarter inch nominal copper tubing with unpainted aluminum fins, two inches by two and a half by 0 0.01 inches, 51.8 fins per foot. I haven't found that eight tenth of a fin yet, but I know it's out there somewhere. It might be loose in the box, who knows? Number four says the heating element P5E is half inch nominal copper tubing with unpainted aluminum fins, two and an eighth by two and an eighth by 0 0.008 inches, 55 and a half to 57.1 fins per foot. What we're learning here is the fins in the half inch element are bigger, thinner, and there are more of them per foot. Hence, you're going to get slightly more output per foot, 20 BTUs per foot in this case. Not a lot, but it is significant. It, it's, it's noticeable, let's put it that way. The, the, the question, of course, is, well, who the heck stocks half inch element? Virtually nobody, but it is something that's interesting to take a look at. Now, if we are looking at this the right way, which output are we going to be using? Well, I think the thing we're going to have to make, we're going to have to do is we're going to have to look at 510 BTUs per foot at the average water temperature of 170. How do we figure out how many feet? Well, we all know how to do that. We divide the heat load, we divide the heat load, 4,022 BTUs by the amount of BTUs per foot at the water temperature that we're running. In this case, we're running 180 with an average of 170. All right, so we take a look at that. We have 107, average water temperature, 170 degree output is 510 BTUs per foot. So 4,022 divided by 510 BTUs per foot. For this room, we're looking at about eight feet of baseboard. All right, this was a, if to recall, just to refresh your memory, it was a 15 by 20 foot room. All right, a 15 by 20 foot room that in this case needs eight feet of baseboard. All right, more or less. Now, how many guys? Let me ask you this, and and just chime in on on the on the uh, questions, on the, you know, comment on the in the questions thing. How many of you would have have seen houses where, let's say, you walked into that 15 by 20 foot room and have seen 35 feet of baseboard, all right, covering every every available inch of wall space? Have you ever seen that? Hint, hint. I'm sure you have. Yeah, been there, done that. Wall to wall baseboard. Absolutely, absolutely. You know that's the old-fashioned that's the old-fashioned way of making a uh, uh, way of making of installing baseboard of sizing baseboard. You measure the outside wall. That's step one. Step two: install that much baseboard. Now they make it, so why not put it in, right? Hey, they're not going to be cold on my watch, so let's just load that room up. So in there you got 35 feet of baseboard where at 180 degrees supply water temperature you only needed eight. Well, hello, what does this do? What does what what can we make of this? Well, let's take a look at lower and lower water temperatures. You see the petite seven, sterling rates the petite seven down only as low as 150 degrees. But if we were to look at uh, a different brand, Slantfin, Slantfin actually rates their their baseboard down to about 110 degree average water temperature, which you're gonna get a heck of a lot fewer BTUs per foot. If you make baseboard, what a great idea, right? Um, but but you can see it's rated to, to much, much lower uh, temperatures. So let's say we were doing this and we wanted to put in a modulating condensing boiler. All right, yeah, forget the existing baseboard. We're still sizing baseboard for this room. We wanna put in a modulating condensing boiler and we want that boiler to modulate as much as it possibly can and condense as much as it possibly can. So let's pick a number. Let's take a look at 130 degree average water temperature right there. So the water go under design conditions, the water goes out at 140 and it comes back at 120. We have an average of 130 degree supply water temperature or 100, average, average water temperature of 130 degrees. So that gives us 240 BTUs per foot. Simple math, now 4,022 BTUs divided by 240 BTUs per foot. Now we're looking at about 17 feet of baseboard, a little bit more than half, than double what we had before. 17 feet of baseboard in that room is not, not a big deal. All right, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a killer. We can certainly do that. And we can take advantage of the fact that we have we could put in a condensing boiler. The thing is with baseboard, a lot of po folks will, will automatically de decide that a, if it's baseboard, it has to be 180 degrees. It won't work otherwise. So they, they don't even, op in, a, in a remodel or a rehab, they don't even think about a ModCon boiler. I think that's changing a little bit as, as ModCon boilers have become more common, but there still is that, that pretty pervasive mindset out there that you need to, need to think about. Now, 
Let's go back to that room where they did wall-to-wall -wall baseboard, all right? They put in 35 feet of baseboard. They loaded that sucker up, man, because they could. So they did you a favor. So if it is a if if there is let's say 35 feet of baseboard installed, if there's 35 feet of baseboard installed, the math here now becomes very easy. Now we just have to figure out, well, I know the heat load, 4022. I know how many feet of baseboards installed, 35. How do I figure out how many BTUs per foot do I, do I need? I simply divide the load by the, the amount of radiator installed, and I should come up with my BTU per foot requirement, all right? So if I divide the heat load, 4,022, by the amount of baseboard installed, 35 feet, all right, 4,022 BTUs divided by 35 feet, I will be left with how many BTUs per foot do I need? So 4,022 BTUs divided by 35 feet, I'm down to about 115 BTUs per foot required. That's what I need. So if I take a look at this, what water temperature could I conceivably run? All right, I could conceivably run 120 degrees supply water temperature at a 20 degree delta T because at 110 degree average water temperature, I'm looking at 140 BTUs per foot and I'm fine. All right, so we gotta think about that. When you're looking at a retrofit uh, or a, a boiler replacement, if you will, if you're looking at a boiler replacement, how many of you, and, and chime in on the, on the comment section, if you would, please, how many of you do a, do a heat loss calculation for every boiler replacement that you do? How, how many of you do that? How many of you, when you replace a boiler, the first thing you do is a heat loss? Or do you simply just choose the boiler the new boiler based on the size of the one you're taking out, all right? Most people do that. They, they say, yeah, I, I'm taking this one out. I'm putting this a new one in. What size is the old one? Okay, it's, a, it's an 1800 square foot house. That's a 135,000 BTU output boiler. Has it been working all this time? Why screw with success? Time is money. I gotta get in, I gotta get out. I don't have time for that stuff. When, when you do that, you're making assumptions. You're assuming that the guy 45 years ago did the math all the way so you wouldn't have to, and you're also assuming nothing's changed. So you always wanna do a heat load and, and measure the baseboard. Some po folks will just measure the baseboard, multiply by 500 and say, that's the heat loss. No, that just tells you how much baseboard's installed. It's good information that we could use, all right? So that's, uh, so that's pretty cool. So that's a, a way to use this information. And if you do a heat loss, once you know the information, you can always use it, all right? You can always use it. And we got a few comments out here. John Langan says heat loss is required for permits now, and that's terrific. I mean, that's important, and it should be used. Um, and then you've got other things. You can, again, aggressive outdoor reset, et cetera. So good, good stuff there, guys, good stuff. Um, we'll do a couple more slides, and then we'll take a, again, as your questions come up, please type them on in, and we'll take a break for questions in just a couple seconds. Um, I do want to talk to you about sizing column and tube radiators because in a lot of a lot of older areas you go in and you can't there's no baseboard to measure all right you have to look at the what's the output possibility of the radiators you know maybe you do a heat loss but how do how do I know what the output of these cast iron radiators are and how do I work with that well uh, I'll tell you what if you guys can ever get a hold of something called the Burnham heating helper it's a little little booklet, little pocket booklet that has so much information in it, it's not even funny. These guys did a fantastic job with this thing. A lot of really old stuff in there that, that we've been using for decades that's still valid. And one of them is a, 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 uh, some calculations to help you figure out the output of various um, types of cast iron radiators. And if you take a look, there's two basic time, kinds. There's the column type radiator, as you see in the lower lower left. And in the upper right, you see the, uh, I'm sorry, that's the tube type radiator. Upper right, you see a column type radiator. So you got tube types and column types. So to size one of these radiators, you have to get, you have to get your ruler out and do some dimensions. You wanna find the height of each section. And then you wanna fi find the height of the radiator, which will tell you the height of each section. And then you want to count the number of tubes or columns, the number of tubes or columns, and then count the number of sections. So how tall are the ra is the radiator? How many tubes are in each section? And how many sections do you have? All right, how many sections do you have? That's the information you're looking for. Height, number of tubes or columns, and then the number of sections, all right? And then you, you use a chart, which we're going to show you next, to convert 
uh, to EDR or equivalent direct radiation, equivalent direct radiation. And equivalent direct radiation is like 170 BTUs per square foot at a certain water temperature, which we will show you. All right. So let's do an example. All right. Let's take a tube type radiator like this one right here, a tube type radiator. All right. And it's a five tube radiator. So there's, you know, there's going to be one, two, three, four, five tubes. Each section is 26 inches high, and there's seven sections in, each, in that radiator. So it's a tube type radiator, five tubes per section, 26 inches high, seven sections total. How do we convert that? How do we figure out what's the potential uh, output of that radiator? Let's take a look at this chart. Now, this chart is also in the Burnham Heating Helper, all right? And it's for tubes and columns, all right? And up at the top, we have the height, all right? And then over here on the left-hand side, we have either, you know, from three to seven tubes and from one to five columns. So we, we presume that this was a five-tube radiator, all right? So it's a five-tube radiator, and it's 26 inches high. You can see the way these things are populated. This is, these are the most common sizes, all right? So a five tube radiator, 26 inches high, we follow the row and the column to where they intersect. And we find out that there's three and a half square feet of radiation area per section. So three and a half square feet of radiation area, of surface area, if you will, per section of radiator, all right? So three and a half square feet per section, three and a half square feet per section, times seven sections means the total equivalent direct radiation of that radiator is 24 and a half square feet. If you've ever looked at some old boiler output charts, they'll have the DOE output, they'll have the net IBR output, and then they'll have the, the, the square foot of radiation uh, number, and it's given to you in square feet. Well, it's square feet of EDR. Just take that number, multiply it by 170, and you'll get the output, potential output of the, of the, of the boiler. It's a leftover from steam days. In this example, 24 and a half square feet worth of EDR times 170 BTUs per square foot means that radiator has a potential output of 4,165 BTUs, all right? So three and a half square feet per radiator per section times seven sections, that's 24 and a half square feet worth of EDR for that radiator. 24 and a half square feet worth of EDR times 170 BTUs per square foot all right, gives us a potential output of 4,165 BTUs. If we wanted to stick that radiator in the room we just did, we're good, all right, because that was only 4,022, we got 4,165, we call it a day. Now, that's at a specific water temperature, all right? Let's take a look at what different, how water temperature affects the output of a cast iron radiator, all right? Uh, we found this chart online, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's standard. Now, if you were to look at a steam radiator, all right, a steam radiator with wa boiling water, steam basically, we get about 240 BTUs per, per hour per square foot of EDR. The 170 number comes down from here at 180 degree supply. All right, now we're talking about supply water temperatures here. All right, I'm sorry, average water temperature, excuse me, average water temperature of 180. If our average water temperature was 170, if our supply was 170 and the average, let's, let me try that one again, folks. It's late here too, and I've had that, I've had that quarantini. At a supply water temperature of 180 and an average of 170, I have to now look right here for my output. All right, now my output is 100, and it looks like about 150, uh, 150. Uh, BTUs per square foot of EDR. So that went down what looks to be about 15 degrees or 15 BTUs per square foot, a 10 degree drop in average water temperature, 15 BTUs per square foot worth of EDR was lost. Now, if we were to look, we were to look at a modulating condensing boiler and we wanted to use an average of 130 degree supply water temperature under design conditions, we can go back over here and see we're now at about 70 BTUs per square foot of EDR. So water temperature affects the cast iron radiators obviously very, very much in terms of output because it's mostly radiant. There's very little convection going on here. 
All right, Dave and Rick, I want to throw this over to you guys. What do you have for uh, for questions out there? Anything uh, is is everything uh, looking good out there to people? We've answered some. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. You've been you've been you've been answering the questions yeah. on uh, in, in the in the chat room. Very good. Okay. Uh, okay. We had a couple here. I'm I'm looking at a couple here. What what water temperature were we talking about for 170? Well, we answered that. Yeah, it was uh, at an average of of one and a 180 degree average water temperature. Um, and that would only be for a 70 degree Fahrenheit room temperature. Of, uh, of course, it, you, there would be other charts you'd have to look at for different water temperatures, but 70 is about normal. All right, 70 is about normal. Would you run 180 for cast iron rads then? Well, you could. Uh, there's no reason not to. If you had a big old cast iron radiator and it was a, a lot of times what people will do is a lot of people rehab these older homes and they love the cast iron radiators, but they rehab them, they button up the envelopes and the heat load goes down and they want to reuse these radiators. Now with a little bit of math and if you know the heat load and you know what the what the EDR is, you may be able to say, all right, hey, you know, I don't have to run 180 degree water here. I can run 130 degree water here or 140 degree water here. It's just a matter of you, you, you can't make that decision without doing the math. All right. You have to do the math to know what you can do and what you can't do. All right. What happens if the uh, where should we go? Uh, lower average water temperature with cooling fans, forced convection and baseboard. OK. What happens if the required flow rate is less than one gallon a minute for sizing uh, baseboards for a space? Well, that would be you. That would be, you know, you'd have a heat load of a room of less than 10,000 BTUs. All right. Uh, with. with uh, and you know, one gallon a minute is is about 10,000 BTUs. If you had something that low, yeah, the output would be would 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 be a little bit lower. But what you're seeing there, and this is a good question, Peter, the difference between four gallons a minute and one gallon a minute is about, you know, was at 180 degree water is about 30 degree or about 30 BTUs per foot. If it was much less than that, you know, you probably first off, well, first off, try to run what less than one gallon a minute through anything. It's kind of hard. All right, it is kind of hard. So um, yeah, I'm sure the output would be a little bit lower, but not that much. You know, not 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 that much. All righty, very good, very good. Let us continue. Let us continue, um, and let's talk about radiant floor heating. How's the pace out there, guys? Are we doing okay? It's about 7:30, so we are we are uh, uh, rolling right along here. And I want to talk a little bit about radiant floor heating. Uh, you know, both Dave, Rick, and I, as we we told you guys last week, we 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 kind of cut our teeth at old Wurzbo Company, uh, way back in the old days when uh, you remember the foot and all that fun stuff. So, um, the the between the three of us, we probably taught more people about radiant floor heating than than maybe anybody in the Western Hemisphere. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'd be a fair statement, don't you guys? Yeah. There was a lot of training classes, man. A lot of training a, classes. A lot of training yep. classes, a lot of karaoke, awesome. and a lot of go-kart racing, right? <laughs> um, sizing radiant floor. L let me let me throw. A, I'm going to throw a pop quiz out there for you guys. Uh, and I want to hear where your head's at. Um, everybody out there, just type this in. What what I mean, your answer to this question? What is the best installation method for radiant floor heating? And we'll wait. What you guys do this? What is the best installation method for radiant floor heating? All right. Just type in what you think. The best installation method. All right. We got depends, slab on grade, thin slab, depends, row panel, subfloor panels, above floor, slint, thin slab, in slab. The correct method. I like that one. Slab always depends on the job. Depends. WB, SWB. All right. Pour over, slab, 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 row pecs, uh, speed, floor panels. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of different answers. A lot of different answers. In the in in the case of um, most most guys are talking about some sort of a concrete pour. Uh, I like Anthony Tossi, the one that makes the customer happy. There you go. <laughs> um, the, the, I think the the correct answer is it depends. Um, a lot of folks like to talk about slab, and I love slab because it's it's got thermal mass. Well, thermal mass is interesting. Thermal mass can be both good and bad. It, it, to me, thermal mass is just is. There's good, there's there's advantages and there's drawbacks. What would you guys, uh, Rick and Rick and Dave, what would you say the biggest advantage of thermal mass is? Dave, go uh, ahead. I would, I would say the lowest uh, the lowest temperature that you can get out of it. 
So you're going to supply the lowest water temperature and, and therefore um, keep your boilers off longer, modulate that water temperature down low, um, and you've got a lot of freedom with it uh, after that. So that would be the the one advantage to a slab style system. And, and okay, of course, Rick, you get the tubing patterns wherever you want to do. Okay, very good. Rick, what do you think? One advantage I've actually experienced with um, a, a slab heat job is in my house in Alaska, we would have power outages up in Wasilla on a regular basis. I experienced one power outage of 23 hours, oh, and okay. I had enough heat stored in the house that I only dropped two degrees in 23 hours. So wow. that's an advantage, but it, again, it's not an, uh, the end all. And what would you say the disadvantages are? Um, depending on control strategy, uh, mm -hmm. if I keep my temperature from not overshooting what it should be, uh, you can get some uh, some overshoot uh, with the uh, temperatures by running too hot. So you got to really control the fluid temperature in a big slip, uh, thick slab because you've got like a, a, a big boat that's kind of hard to turn when right. uh, it's, like, yeah. going. it's like trying to do quick maneuvering with an oil tanker. Yeah, good. Right, right. <laughs> and Dave, um, I look at it as uh, if you like to change the temperature in a space, is and and you like it cooler at night compared to during the day, or vice versa. Very hard to get that control out of a slab. Like Rick says, once it gets warmed up, it's just going to sit there and store that energy in there. Um, right. The advantage coming back to that is, you know, if you're that guy with that boiler system trying to tweak out every last BTU and make that boiler condense all day long, the colder the water, the better. But then again, it could be a disservice to the homeowner based on what they're looking for. My view is a little different. I think the biggest advantage to thermal mass, a concrete slab, is you have a lot of leeway to screw up the installation and still get away with it. <laughs> it's incredibly forgiving. I mean, you have to go in with malice of forethought to screw up a slab job. You really do <laughs> in terms of installing the tubing in the water tank. You, you've got to try to mess it. I could send you yeah. some pictures. I, I, hey, listen, I, I know there are people who have tried. I know that. I've seen. I've probably seen a lot of But you really got to make an effort to screw it up. There's so much forgiveness. You've got a leeway to, miss, to mess on, miss on your water temperature, miss on your tube spacing a little bit, and get away with it. All right? The, the, to me, the biggest advantage, that's the biggest advantage, along with it's, you know, hey, you, you tie it down, they're pouring the slab anyway, so it's easy, right? The yeah. biggest disadvantage, again, goes to, to me, goes to the fact that, well, if I'm doing a second floor bathroom, I ain't pouring a, I, you know, a retrofit, I ain't pouring a slab, right? Or if, I, you know, if the house hasn't been framed for it, I'm not pouring, you know, I'm not pouring an inch and a half in, of overpour. If the, the, if the basement slab's already been poured, I don't have that option to me. So, th so it's not it's not a, an option that you can use everywhere. It's if they're pouring a slab and if you get there before they pour the concrete, that's a critically important element of radiant floor heating. Put the tubing down before they pour the concrete in the basement. It's a hell of a lot easier that way. Then you've got it. Then it's then it's pretty easy. It's just not a versatile installation method. So really, I, my, my opinion is that the, the best installation method is the one that makes the most sense for the job you're looking at today. Someday Great. it might be like a thin panel yeah. over the subfloor, okay? An underlayment kind of thing. Sometimes it might be between the floor joists with aluminum plates or without aluminum plates. It's, it, it does work, you know, you gotta do the map, but it does work, um, you know, or, or it could be in a, in, a, in, a, in a lightweight pour, gypsum concrete pour, it could be in the slab. It just depends on what the job you're looking at in, involves that, the, the, to get that job done for that particular day. No matter which one exactly. you choose, yep. say, say again? No matter which one you choose, no matter which one you choose, you do need to start here. You got to find out the BTU per square foot requirement. How many BTUs per square foot do I need to get out of this radiator? Okay. The floor is your radiator. We're going back to that cast iron radiator thing. It's we took a cast iron radiator and just bulldozed it and made it flat and spread it out over the entire floor. That's what we're talking about. How many BTUs per square foot do we need to get out of this floor? in order to satisfy the heating load under design conditions. So to figure that out, it's BTU load divided by the square feet of the room that we're in, all right, that we're trying to heat, 
and that's going to equal BTUs per square foot. There's an asterisk here. We know that. In kitchens, you have cabinet space. You put tubing under cabinet space, it keeps the cabinets nice and warm, but in terms of heating the room, it simply doesn't count. You can't rely upon it. Same thing in bathrooms. If you put tubing under the vanity and under the, the bathtub, it's nice. It's nice to have a warm bathtub. It's one of the cool things you can do with radiant. It simply doesn't count in terms of effective radiant floor space. So you'd have to back that stuff out in doing those calculations. But for our purposes, it's just a 15 by 20 square foot room, a 300 square foot room. That's the number we're going to use. So in our example, BTUs, the BTUs is 4,022 divided by the 300 square feet. Remember, it was a 15 by 20 foot room. 4,022 divided by 300 square feet. That gives us a BTU per square foot load of 13.4. So I need to get out of my floor under design conditions. In, in our example, our outdoor design condition was zero degrees, right? Under, uh, under zero degree temperatures, I need to get 13.4 BTUs per square foot out of that floor, right? It doesn't matter if I can get more, right? A lot of people say, well, you have to put that in so you can maximize the output. You can get more output this way. I got to get what I got to get. I, if I can get more, it doesn't matter, right? It's like if everybody obeyed the speed limit, what good is a car that can go over 55 miles an hour? In this case, 13.4 is the speed limit and it's universally enforced. I, it doesn't matter if I can get 40, who the heck cares, right? It's, it doesn't make any difference. I only need 13.4 BTUs per square foot in this room. Now, here's another thing about radiant floor heating, all right? Radiant floor heating gives off heat based exclusively on its surface temperature, all right? It's a radiator, it's a radiant heater, it's a radiator. So it gives off heat based exclusively on its surface temperature. The warmer the surface of the floor, the more BTUs per square foot it will give off. Remember that, that's gonna be important in a minute. Final step is we have to then determine our installation method. Is it slab? Is it uh, something on top of the floor? Is it between the floor joists with plates? Whatever it is, that's, we have to choose that. And then we're gonna look up our water temperatures based on that. But we also have to, as best as we can, determine the finished floor material and its corresponding R value. We have to find the finished floor material and its corresponding R value. Now, I got another pop quiz for you guys. It's time for you guys to, 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 to type in your, an, your, your answers in the, uh, in the question section here. Um, is, and it's a pretty simple, pretty simple question. Which finished floor material, which finished floor material requires a higher surface temperature to heat the room, tile or carpet? Which finished floor material is going to require a higher surface temperature to heat the room, tile or carpet? I see a lot of carpets. Let me ask, I'm gonna ask that question again. Everybody's typed in their answer. I'm gonna ask that question again. Let me say something. Which, yes, go right ahead. You guys know John Barber, right? <laughs> and, you, and you know he's throwing you a curveball, so be very careful with your answers. This isn't a curveball. This is a knuckleball. <laughs> it's going every every which way. <laughs> which finished floor material requires a higher surface temperature to heat a room, tile or carpet? A few of you got it. I saw these answers popping up. I saw a few of these popping up. A few of you got it. And Jim Prisby, I would expect you to get this one. <laughs> That's right. That's right, Chris. He's, an, he's another strong. one of the Wurzbo expatriates. <laughs> I think I think Taco leads the league in, in former Wurzbo employees. <laughs> yeah, the temperature should be the same. All right. The surface temperature should be the same for either finished floor material. Think about this. If you need a 75 degree floor surface temperature to heat a room, all right, Seven, a 75 degree carpet surface temperature and a 75 degree tile surface temperature are both 75, right? They're both 75. They're both 75 degrees. So 75 isn't, it's the same, right? It's the same. Tiles, a tile 75 isn't cooler than a carpet 75. Now, what we might, what we're going to have to do to get there is going to be different. So that was the, that was the, the knuckleball in the question. All right. What we're going to have to do to get there is going to be different. But the surface temperature that we're aiming for is the same in, in either case. So carpet, tile, doesn't matter. If we need a 75 degree floor, we need a 75 degree floor. All right, very good, that was fun. Let's now go to our output chart, okay? 
And this is for this is comes to us from uh, I think this one is from uh, Mr. Pex, but they pretty much every radiant manufacturer has something like this or similar to. It's an output chart, and in this case, it's between the floor joists. BTJ stands for between the floor joists with aluminum heat emission plates, and these are CFIN heat transfer plates below the subfloor with tubing eight inches on center. Over on the left hand side of the chart, you see your BTU per square foot load. Okay, right here, you see your BTU per square foot load. Uh, over on the right hand side is our surface temperature. Now, let's take a look. Let's forget what we have in the middle. Th those lines there represent finished floor R values. Our heat load is right about here, 13.4 BTUs per square foot, all right? right there, 13.4 BTUs per square foot. If we ran a line all the way over here, we would find that we, we would find the floor surface temperature that we would need to heat that room under design conditions. All right, and in this case, let's, let's call it 75 degrees, okay? Based on what we're looking at, we're gonna call that 75 degrees. So no matter what, I need a floor that's 75 degrees under design conditions to heat that room. Now, what do I have to do to get there? Well, now I got to figure out what is the finished floor R value? What's the material and what's its corresponding R value? And radiant manufacturers have books you can look this stuff up in, which is very, very helpful. But for our purposes, let's presume it's a carpet and pad, a, a good residential carpet and pad with a combined R value of 2.0. To find the water temperature, we follow our BTU per square foot line over to the um, going from left to right until it meets the R value 2.0 line. And then where they, the two lines meet, we drop straight down to find our supply water temperature. And in this case, it's looking like it's about 122 degrees. So under design conditions, in order to get a 75 degree floor surface temperature with a carpet and pad with an R value of 2.0, to get 13.4 BTUs per square foot, I need about 122 degree water. Does that make sense to everybody? That's pretty simple. That's how, how you work this chart. Now, I have another question for you. Here's another pop quiz. Isn't this fun? It's pop quiz day. 13.4 um, BTUs per square foot. That's when it's zero degrees outside, right? That's when it's zero degrees outside. Now, what happens when it gets warmer? Let's say it's at 50% load. In this case, it might be 35 degrees because we did 70 indoors to zero outdoors. So 50% load would be 35 degrees outdoors. At 35 degrees outdoors, our BTU per square foot load looks like it's a, almost 6.7. Now, you know what? We're going to call it 7 BTUs per square foot. We'll round up. Our BTU per square foot load is right here. If we follow that over here, we find that we might now need a 72 degree floor surface temperature. So when it's zero outside, the floor needs to be 75. When it's 35 outside, the floor needs to be 72. My pop quiz to you guys, and again, write in your, write in your thoughts. My pop quiz to you is, how does the floor know? How does the floor know that when it's 35 degrees outside, I only have to be 72 degrees on the floor surface, and when it's zero degrees, I have to be 75. How does the floor know? How does it know? What do you think? <laughs> Let's see what you got. Type your answer, type your thoughts in. All right. Do, 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 do. John Lang and I know you'd knew. I know you would know this answer. You've been you've you've heard me yap on long enough. <laughs> uh got a lot of good answers. They're all kind of all over the place. They're kind of all over the place. We got outdoor sensors, we got thermal equivalent, we have it doesn't, we have uh, sorry. You're, you're breaking up, Johnny. If you can hear me on my end, you are breaking up. You have frozen and so has Dave. So hopefully it's not me. Hello. Good, Derek, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what happened to Dave and uh, John, but uh, 
I, I can continue on if, <laughs> if that's what needs to. Yeah, it's the Rick show. Who said that? Um, anyway, I, I'm going to go ahead and keep on going until they come back in. But I think where John's going with that, um, that question. Are you guys back now? Dave, are you back? Um, well, it's just me at this point in time. <laughs> So yeah, I, I can hear you still loud and clear. The other guys uh, kind of faded out. So. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe it's an East Coast thing. Of course, I'm uh, right here in Salt Lake City. You know, uh, so far uh, my internet is working. So um, I think jo where John was going with that is his. Uh, he was asking that question based on um, what's the one thing that gives you and I uh, that tells uh, the heating system when to stop giving heat, and that I think that's where he was going with that. And of course. It's the room temperature and the thermostat that's in the room, right? So uh, I always looked at it like a, a triangle, right? Uh, at the top, we have room set point temperature. We have down on one end of the pyramid, we have, of course, the BTUs per square foot. And out on the other side, we have, you know, uh, what the surface temperature is. So the surface temperature is tied to the BTUs per square foot, is tied to the set point temperature. And most of these European charts that we're looking at now, uh, as John referenced, it's probably uh, from Mr. Pex, is uh, actually based on 20 degrees Celsius room set point temperature. To uh, North American folks that still use Fahrenheit, that is 68 degrees. So that's the tr that's the triangle at this point in time. So 13.4 BTUs per uh, square foot. We need surface temperature of 75, and then uh, that's at a set room set point of 68 degrees. So I, I think that's where he was going with that. Again, uh, now all of a sudden I'm sitting at his desk with his, and I can't forward his slides. So anyway, hopefully those guys can jump back on here. Otherwise, maybe we can switch around and I'll use my own computer. <laughs> So uh, we'll give it we'll give it a little bit, but uh, we gotta we gotta I suppose suspect, uh, expect uh, issues with uh, things. So anyway, well, I see Dave is uh, back up. Can you hear us, Dave? Yeah, I don't see Dave. He didn't come up on the video yet. And normally they they're plastering us on the top uh, of the screen there. So we'll see what happened. I saw him freeze up and uh, maybe Rick, if you want to get back it. online, everybody. And I am trying to get the presentation back up and running again. Give me. A okay. All Is right. JB there yet? Nope. I don't see him. Okay. Well, ho hopefully you have control of it, Dave, because I, I don't, I mean, I can switch gears and put my presentation up if you want. So I'll just somebody and I can't, you know. uh, I can't take over the screen. Well, let's see. Change present the stuff world. Maybe Rick, if you want to open up to general questions uh, about this or anything. Sure. sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, again, uh, I'm I'm looking at my. Uh, yeah, it's just people saying they can't see uh, John and Dave and so on and so forth. Uh, nothing's uh, on my question drop down is is kind of limited. Uh, okay. But um, if you can see it, uh, give me a shout. I'll, I'll try to answer as uh, as best I can. Uh, someone to stand alone thermostats. Okay, uh, I see that popped in there. Floor sensor, a good idea. Yeah, floor sensors are great uh, as long as, uh, you, I mean, it adds, you know, something to the job as far as the installation of the floor sensor as well as the dollars that are involved. But uh, typically we would recommend floor sensors when we had uh, a, a potential problematic uh, floor covering, like a exotic hardwood that was you know like oh i can't ever exceed 82 degrees and we could set some high limit uh, parameters there for that but um anyway um dave if you can see the questions I, i'm having a real hard time with my drop down window um hopefully that answered the floor sensor floor sensor is a good thing when, when i was selling that equipment absolutely i would build those into those jobs that required it but it does add money and add some installation time and such uh, one um, my question says, Rick, why does the orange line go to the 84 surface temp when we said it needed 75? Oh, uh, say say that one more time. I didn't I didn't get it. I'm sorry. One of the questions was, why does the orange line go to 84 surface temp when we said it needed 75? Yeah, I, I, I'd have to look at at, at that again. Uh, Again, there's a certain amount of, um, we call it the heat flux of the floor. So how much energy is coming off the surface 
of the radiant floor. And that's usually, uh, we can actually predict that. We know we've done a, 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 you know, tons of testing, and we know that uh, in, in, in lighter load conditions, let's say about 15, 20 BTUs a square foot, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, 1.8587 uh, uh, BTUs per degree differential. So uh, let's say the surface temperature is X and the, the thermostat set point is Y, whatever the difference is in that, you times that by about 1. Uh, let's say 87 on lower. It, it approaches two, to, two BTUs per degree differential, uh, the heat flux, when you're up into big loads like approaching 35 BTUs a square foot or something like that. So hopefully that answers the question. It's all in how much heat I'm delivering per square foot is based on the differential temperature of the condition space that I'm trying to maintain. Okay. Uh, question here, what do you think about the smart thermostats with multi-room sensors? Well, is that uh, information from each zone coming back to one source or one control module? Is that, is that uh, I, I guess I clarify that and I can answer that. Uh, again, I've been out of the control business for a little while now. Uh, there's all kinds of cool stuff out there uh, with several brands and I don't wanna step on anybody's toes. So uh, I guess I'd have to clarify smart thermostat at this point. Zone valve or zone pump to control the manifold? Uh, well, it depends uh, on what you prefer. Um, personally speaking, uh, you can't see very much of my floor back there, but this house is heated with uh, Radiant, one of the aftermarket uh, retrofit products. Um, you folks are familiar with Climate Panel and uh, uh, Quick Track and some other things, and that's what uh, my wife and I remodeled this house like 18 years ago. and. Um, uh, again, I use uh, uh, operating actuators. Uh, I have a total of um, 16 loops throughout the house, and uh, I have within that about nine zones. So uh, uh, that makes it really easy to do room by room zoning. Johnny, I see your face, but you're not moving. Are you still frozen? No, your <laughs> eyes are. Can you hear me, John Barber? But um, anyway, um, zoning with uh, pumps or zoning with. Uh, uh, actuators, or we used to call telestats. Um, again, that's a preference thing. Uh, we, I would tend to say, if you've got big manifold locate or manifolds with large locations, big uh, loads as far as GPM uh, required at that zone, then uh, maybe a circulator makes sense per manifold location. Uh, my preference is, of course, uh, actuators. Uh, I've got one little tiny little wattage pump doing 2,000 square foot of my house. So uh, the, the actuators don't use much at all. So. John, can you hear? I can't hear you, Johnny. Um, for whatever reason, you're not coming through. I'm not sure about the other individuals, but I'm just uh, taking some questions right now. So, uh, What else? Um, let's see. Uh, it says, what about other types of radiant panels, walls and ceilings? Uh, as far, what about them? Uh, they're absolutely out there. They're, it's a good way to do, uh, you know, in my view, if uh, on a full remodel uh, job where you can't do the radiant floor, my next choice would always be uh, some radiant wall, uh, some wainscot height uh, uh, material of one form or another, uh, and uh, do it that way. Uh, that will tend to heat the floor as well as uh, the occupants and the uh, everything inside the room, it does a really good job. My third choice, of course, would be radiant ceiling. So, um, I'm I'm good with all three of those. We've taught on all three. Uh, personally, I, I'm living in radiant floor because it was an easy remodel uh, for me. But uh, so, I see somebody hey, trying to poke their head in. Dave, is that you? But uh, no volume. So I don't know what's happening on the East Coast there. But I am back. It looks like yes. All right. Good and I'm back too. All right. Everybody's well, uh, fun, huh? after hours. You guys just let me off the hook. Now I can uh, continue you... with my margarita. <laughs> yeah, how many quarantines have you had, John? Um, how many quarantinis have I had? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm still working on just the one here. 
Hey, Johnny, uh, let's talk about what we covered while you were uh, taking a hiatus and you too, Dave. All righty, um, let's do that. So, so I just went in, you were talking about the relationship between beach use per square foot over into surface area. Hey, Martini. <laughs> So, so, and then at the top of the pyramid, I was talking about room set point temperature, right? And what the thermostat is seeing. And I think I answered your question for you is the thermostat's the one that's gonna decide how long that system runs and what the surface temperature needs to be, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I gave up, uh, let the cat out of the bag there uh, for you. But that's where we left off. We were talking about heat flux and how many BTUs uh, come off the floor depend is contingent on what the room set point temperature is, of course, and what the floor surface temperature delta is. That's kind of where we left it. And there were some uh, some questions that I answered based on zone valves and telestats, or excuse me, zone pumping and telestats and that sort of thing. So take it from there, my friend. Hey, there you go. All right. Now, who's, whose screen is being shared? Is it my screen? It should oh. be back to you, John. It should be back to me. Now I got to find my presentation. Okay, let's uh, get that presentation up. And we can finish up because we were on next to pretty much close to our last slide here. So there we go. All righty. Do you guys see uh, boiler selection? Nope. We just see Dave, you, and I. So share that screen. There you go. All righty. Very good. I love it when the plan comes together. You know, that's the way of the internet. Nothing's ever smooth 100% of the time. But at least, uh, thank goodness, we, we Ricky, you were able to, to save the day. Uh, and we didn't lose too many guys out there. We lose, lost a few, but that's all right. Um, I, I think we got a lot of uh, Zoom happy hours kicking in right about now across the country. So. <laughs> there you go. I think you're right. I think you're right. Okay, then. Uh, let's go back to the where, where, where we left off was boiler selection now. Um, I want to talk about boiler selection total load. 82,401 BTUs is our total load. And, excuse me, that's a martini coming back. And we have these boilers here. Um, and what I would, what I was, what, this is when I learned that I, uh, um, that I had, we had somehow lost things because I, I, I got up to this point talking to myself, just rolling right along. And then it, then I asked, which boiler would you guys choose? And there was nothing. <laughs> there was well, no answers. Johnny, nothing. Let's go, with that in mind, let's go back a little bit because where you, where we lost both of you was okay. talking about the uh, floor surface tip right there. So, okay. I mean, we did all that and we did, uh we were doing aluminum plates and whatever your next slide is is might what you what you went into so. yeah this is where well, we started talking about floor surface temperature and right. you know how does the floor know to right. how does the floor know to be 72 and a half degrees when it's zero degrees outside and 71 degrees or whatever it was or 75 degrees when it's zero degrees outside and 72 degrees when it was 35 degrees outside and the answer was the thermostat when yeah. the thermostat's happy, it shuts off, and that's it. We just don't get any more heat. A lot of yeah. people say, well, what about like the flywheel effect? What about that heat? There's still heat in that system, and it's giving off energy and blah, blah, blah. I says, yeah, it is. But even a low-mass radiant system is a high-mass heating system, right? A low mass, you know, Between the floor joists with aluminum plates is kind of a lower-mass heating system, but it's a lower-mass radiant system compared to concrete, but it's still a high-mass system. That mass has the ability to absorb a boatload of BTUs, a boatload of energy, without raising its surface temperature even one degree. So, uh, you know, a concrete slab can absorb up to like 10 to 12,000 BTUs, maybe even more, without raising its surface temperature. In this case, it's not even close to that. We're talking 13.4 BTUs. It can, it can, that floor can absorb BTUs without releasing it up to the to the room because of that thermal, uh, uh, that that thermal. Um, equilibrium between the surface temperature of the floor and the temperature right above the floor. So th there's no replacement for thermostats. When you zone a room, when you zone rooms together, or when, when, you ch when you're when you setting out your zoning strategy, all right, did we, did, were you guys on board when I started talking about the, the three stipulations for zoning a room together? Go ahead. Uh, okay, we, you lost me at that point? Okay. Yeah. Um, the three stipulations for zoning rooms together with radiant floor are fairly simple. The first stipulation, and all three have to be met, all right, in order to put these together, all three have to be met. The first stipulation is that the the usage pattern of all three of the rooms has to be consistent, okay? They have to be considered like the same big area. And so we're talking kitchen, kitchen, breakfast room, family room that are kind of open to one another. 
the, that's a candidate for zoning a bunch of rooms together. Kitchen, breakfast room, bedroom, no, not at all. The second stipulation is that the BTU per square foot load has to be consistent. Close. They're not going to be the same, but they got to be within, within a few BTUs of one another. So in this case, 13.4 BTUs. Okay, if I had a room that was 15 BTUs, that's close enough. If I had a room that was 11, B, you know, 11 or 12 BTUs, close enough. 25 BTUs, no, you're out of the pool. We can't play with you, all right? The third stipulation that has to be met is that the, the, the required floor surface temperatures have to be similar. Same, same rule, different numbers, all right? Uh, is that they have to be this, they have to be close to one another. So 75 BTUs per or 75 degrees on a floor surface temperature, we can go down to 72 and a half or 73, maybe, 76, maybe, you know, as long as they're consistent. If you got, you know, 75 and 80. No, that's probably too much of a swing or 72 and 80. That's too much of a swing. You can't zone those things together. When it comes to usage patterns, again, bedrooms, don't zone bedrooms together. They have different usage patterns. Uh, master bedroom, master bath, zone them separately because they're going to have different usage patterns. You put radiant floor heating is because when you're in a, in a bathroom, because when you're wet and naked, you want to be warm, wet and naked. When you go to bed at night, you turn the thermostat in the bedroom down. So goes, so goes the bathroom. So you don't want to you don't want to make those mistakes. A lot bed radiant has a lot of zones, and that brings with it some uh, some that brings with it some unintended consequences that we'll deal with as we as we move along. Particularly the effect of micro zoning on boiler cycling. We'll talk about that uh, a few sec a few sessions down the road. So let's go to the last slide then. Excellent. We're going to get through this. And we'll talk about boiler selection. We're going to the last part, last section of this part. Boiler selection. Our total load, if you remember from our first slide, was 82,401 BTUs. 82,401 BTUs. So with that, taking a look at the boilers shown here, which boiler would you select? So this is this is where I found out I lost you because I asked that and nobody said a word. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, guys, what um, what boilers would you choose out of this spec sheet which boilers would you choose so type in your answers please okay let's see what we got here well everybody's pretty close yeah okay yeah it's gonna in this case it's gonna be either the 304 or the 305, more more than likely, 304 or the 305. You can play around a little bit. I see Ken Best says 303 with a main priority zone. Yeah, you're playing a shell game with the BTUs, and that's that's cool. You can certainly do that. Um, in this case, let's take a look at the what, the, the reason we're asking the this. 309. The 309. Yes, yes, we have to move that thing. <laughs> the 309, and we'll put some auxiliary heaters in as well because nobody's calling me up, right? Um, we're going to look at the 303 and the 304, but the real reason I'm asking you this is it's going to depend on which column you're looking at. If you look at the columns, you see the input. That's in this case, it's the it's the the gas the the gas input, the gas rating input. All right. If you look at the next two columns, you have the DOE heating capacity, and then the next column is the net AHRI, or in some cases the net IBR rating. Uh, uh, rating. So you have two output columns. You got one input column and you get two output columns. How can one boiler have two outputs? That's cray cray, as my daughter would say. This is nuts. How do you, how do, you do that? Uh, and which one do you use? All right. If we went strict DOE, strict DOE, we could certainly use that 304 because DOE heating capacity is 88,000. But if we look at the net AHRI, it's 77,000. That might be a little shy. If we look at the 305, okay, we're good. 305, 102,000 net IBR, net AHRI, let's go, all right? It's gonna be one of the two. What I wanna share with you as we, as we finish up tonight is simply the difference, the difference between DOE and AHRI slash IBR. First off, let's take a look at the DOE capacity. The DOE capacity is basically a federal output rating. The Department of Energy rates boilers in terms of output, all right? What the DOE presumes, what the DOE presumes, all right, is that the boiler and all of the associated piping is installed in a heated area. So in that case, 
any jacket losses or piping losses are considered useful or usable heat, all right, and they will help offset the calculated heating load. Now, what do we mean by a, a living space, all right, or a heated area? Uh, my old house in Minnesota, if, you, if anybody ever came, watched the w old webinars we used to do on Minnesota, I, I, my office was in the mechanical room because that's where my wife said I could have it. She also installed a door that locked from the outside. It's the way it goes. Uh, but the um, in that mechanical room, it was also my office. It was also the, the laundry room. I had radiant floor heating in that office, and it was surrounded by bedrooms, family room, air, living areas, upstairs was all, it was all, you know, living space on our main floor. For all intents and purposes, that's a heated area. The DOE capacity works just fine there. What does AHR IBR output mean? Well, it's pretty old school, all right? It's pretty old school and it's, the math is, is pretty simple. The AHR slash IBR simply slices 15% off the DOE rating. Every DOE rating, you take, you, you just chop 15% off it, you get the net IBR slash AHRI. That's the magic. What do those, why 15% and where does it come from? Well, first off, there's two elements here. First off, IBR, old school, back in the old days, they, can, they would presume that the boiler was installed in an unheated, unconditioned basement, all right? Unheated, unconditioned basement. So any jacket losses and piping losses, well, yes, they did temper the basement, were considered wasted, not usable heat. They didn't heat anything in where you lived. So that was a portion of the 15%, jacket losses and piping losses considered wasted. Another part of the 15% was is, is for something called the pickup allowance. And IBR defined the pickup allowance as the amount of energy needed the amount of energy needed to heat up the delivery system. We're talking about old systems with cast iron radiators, cast iron baseboard, and, ca and black iron pipe, all right? You needed to heat that pipe up before you could deliver heat through it to a room. So the pickup allowance is a certain amount of energy set aside to heat up the delivery system, all right? So when it comes to which output do I choose, to size my boiler, I think the biggest thing is it's going to depend upon where the boiler is going to be installed. To me, if it's in a, if you look at it and it's one of these things where it's, you know it's it's now a modern closet or it's it's surrounded in a finished basement that sort of thing, I think the DOE rating is perfectly fine. If it's in an unconditioned, unheated basement, all right, and if it's connected to an older system where there's that looks there's a lot of pipe and you know it's a black iron and everything, then you're going to be looking at the net AHR or net IBR rating. Knowing the difference between the two may, in some instances, save you uh, a, a boiler size. Now, I just, I, I'm interested in what Ken Best had to say about uh, about you know going with that smaller boiler with a priority zone. And there are guys, and I know a lot of them, that they'll pick a boiler really small and they'll play a shell game with the BTUs, which is cool. There's nothing wrong with that. You can play a shell game with the BTUs. Uh, and that that works just fine. Uh, it's just that if there is ever an instance where the uh, where the where the the homeowner wants all of the zones calling at the same time, well, uh, no, that's not going to work. It's you you you're not going to have that. So you got to know your customers pretty well, and you got to they got to know you pretty well. But it sure, certainly will work because you may reach a point where okay, it's really cold out, and I want this this zone this zone and this zone all 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 warm and it doesn't work you, you're asking for a little bit of interaction but if it works for you and works for your customers by golly you're gonna you're gonna make sure that boiler's maximum in terms of efficiency which is pretty cool all righty that ends today's lesson next week we're going to be talking about figuring flow rates with our friend the universal hydronics formula we're going to talk about pipe sizing we're going to talk about air control and we're also going to talk about uh, pumping away. What is that all about? Why do we care about that? And what does it matter? And what, why, why, when do you have to pump away? Or when maybe do you not have to pump away? Uh, so let's, let, we'll, we'll take a look at both of those, uh, all of those situations in our next session. So with that, all right, I'm going to just end the show and uh, open up. Get the, we'll get the, the webcams up there. Everybody's got their webcam up. And now it's time for all of us to just kind of sit back and chat and, and ask questions of one another uh you got you got you got three guys here that do nothing but train so we'll we will stay on as long as you guys want to stay on and answer whatever questions y'all have about anything any comments for, from from rick and dave on what we went through tonight 
was all good. Uh, from you myself. left me hanging there, so I had to like jump in and fly. I was I was ready to bring up my presentation to start covering. <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen. You did some vamping there, Rick. That's good stuff, man. <laughs> yeah, Rick was the man there. He was covering in. There you go. There you go. Um, what's right, with this got... East Coast West Coast thing, man? I mean, I never had a problem. What, what's what's yeah, up did with that? You, did you freeze up at the same time, Dave? Oh, Dave, oh, yeah. both, we lost both of you at the same time. Oh my gosh. That's you know, odd. Is, yeah, I yeah. just kept. I was I was yakking away, having a grand old time, and and then I realized, oh, nothing's happening here. Uh oh, it happened again. This happened a while ago as well. Um, all righty. Some I'm just looking at some of the some of the things that are in here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, can you speak to elevation derating quickly? Asked the guy at 6,500 square 6,500 feet. Yes, derating. Rick, take it away. Um, actually, what I've been teaching is uh, just find out what uh, your the local people that deliver your gas, whoever that utility is. They'll give you the caloric value of that gas, and just use that. You don't have to. Uh, derate based on elevation as long as you've already derated based on the caloric value of the gas that's being delivered at that elevation. So again, don't double dip. People have done that at least to oversizing. So uh, that's the best way to do it. If you can't find that out, then go out. Most of your boiler manufacturers will give you based on elevation, uh, typically uh, 2,000 foot on up, they'll let you know how how much to de derate that boiler uh, based on that elevation. Right, I, and I can actually find that in this presentation here in a second. Let me uh, get that up here. I did have it on that last, that that very last screen. So let me get, let me open that up again. Uh, ba -bum, bum, 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 bum. Where are you, where are you, where are you? Take go, quarantine, no, where's take go after dark? There it is, all right. Uh, ha, 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 ha. It was on the very last slide. John, you're so organized. I was being efficient and, and closing this thing out <laughs> way ahead of time. Here we go. Uh, yeah, down at the bottom here, it should tell you for this particular boiler, uh, all mo all uh, models certified for use from sea level to 10,000 feet in elevation. Outputs are reduced by 4% per 1,000 feet above sea level for elevations above 200 feet or 2,000 feet. So you 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 reduce that output by four percent every thousand feet above two thousand feet. And no, normally your modulating boiler companies will be somewhere around half of that. So two thousand okay. uh, BTUs per thousand foot after two thousand foot. Again, I check with them. It's in writing. You got to get it from them, but it's, that's generally the rule. Hey guys, right. this is Eric. Can you hear me? Eric, Hi, Eric. how you doing? Hey, hey, I got a. I got. I want to bring something up, and it goes back to the radiators and baseboard. So here in Minnesota, I do a ton of retrofit and boiler replacements. And I don't know if I'm looking for verification, but give me your thoughts on this. A lot of times, uh, I'm up against copper fin tube baseboard, and so I'm sizing my boilers based on water temp uh, and how much baseboards in the house. So I, I measure everything. And then I go through the charts to see how low of a water temp I can run based off of what's there for baseboard. But then I do the same thing when I'm installing a new boiler on an old cast iron radiator or baseboard system. So basically with the, ba the base the radiators, I have to size to the radiators based on the water temp I, I want to run. Can you comment on that? Because I don't think a lot of um maybe younger installers quite understand that concept that you are you you have a fixed amount of um heat emitter and you have to size to that does that make sense go ahead john because I, i've not done radiators that often uh you know growing up and coming up in the trade in alaska and then coming down here to salt lake there's a few down here but i personally don't have that expertise on radiators now, Eric, is what you're saying uh, you want to size the boiler to support the radiation? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because um, let's say you, you get an anomaly where a house has exactly the amount of radiation uh, footage or, or square footage and based on a specific water temperature. I mean, you can't, 
if you've got a if you've got a situation where a customer says, well, my you know it, it never seemed to heat quite right. Uh, maybe they don't have enough radiation, or maybe the boiler wasn't set up right. But mm-hmm. if you're putting a new boiler in, you can't increase the output because you have a fixed amount of heat emitter. So basically, you're sizing your new boiler uh, replacement to match what you have for output. At least that's how I I've been doing it. Right. You can you can increase the output by running a hotter water temperature. All right. I mean, back in the old days, IBR, the first IBR class I ever went to, they actually said, if you increase the water temperature of your boiler, run it up to like 200 degrees instead of at 180, you'll get more output per foot of baseboard. So you can use less baseboard and that will that will save that that will make your in installation less expensive. That's how they were competing against forced air, which <laughs> didn't really work very well. But I mean, it, from a from a math standpoint and from a heating standpoint, it absolutely would. If I ran 200 degree water with an average temperature of 190 compared to 180 degree water with an average of 170, yeah, I may be able to use a few feet few less of baseboard every in every room, and that might save me 20 feet of baseboard over the course of an in, of a big installation. Um, and if I were to size the boiler based on measuring the radiation, uh, and I ran it at 180, I wouldn't get enough heat. But if I ran it at 200, I would. Is that kind of where we're going here? Yeah, it is. I guess maybe I kind of took it the wrong path. Um, I guess I'm focusing on installs where I'm moving from cast iron to a mod con. So I'm trying to figure out what I have for radiation and how I can size at a lower temperature. Um, and And that's going to dictate both the boiler size and the temperature delivery in the system. So I guess, I think I, I'm not, I'm probably not wording what I'm trying to convey quite, quite right, but you Let have a talk. fixed amount of radiation and you have to work with that. So your ba- your boiler is going to start there, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think, I think, well, your boiler, it, your boiler starts with the heat load, in my opinion. You start with the heat load and then you factor in the the existing radiation and what you need from from my point. Yeah, Rick, you were you were ready to jump in. Well, I, I think maybe where Eric's going with that is in the back of my mind, I'm not a steam guy. I've, I've dabbled in it a little bit, but uh, there was something uh, uh, about um, matching the boiler size to the amount of radiation that you have, uh, capability that you EDR that you have out in the, the, the place or vice versa. And maybe Eric, that's what you were thinking, but I think you're on the right track. You, you're saying, okay, at the temperature that I want to run these condensing boilers, how many BTUs can I get out of each of those uh, radiators, and will that suffice in meeting the load requirement of each of those rooms? And uh, I, I don't see anything wrong with that. I, I, I think you could play with that fluid temperature, and you're going to get, you know, you lower that, you lower that temperature, you're going to get lower out. The only thing I've ever heard people complain about is so that person that you sell that system to that's used to having 180 degree water in that radiator is unless you do a good job of talking to them up front, they're going to complain about that radiator not being as hot as it used to be. Even yeah. though the room's comfortable, <clears throat> they're feeling something different. <laughs> yeah, the room's more comfortable than it ever was, but that radiator's not hot, dang it. Yep. 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 Okay. Some more good points here. Uh, what was the what's the delta T of radiant slab at design? It depends on on the manufacturer. This is from Chuck LeMay. It depends on the manufacturer, Chuck. Uh, what we see is at, at Wurzbo, we used to design, and most radiant systems are designed to a delta T of 10 for residential applications, a delta T of 10, and that's done for floor surface comfort and consistency of floor surface temperature. There are exceptions to that, um, you know, uh, with really small pipe. I remember with uh, with the Quick Track product that we sold, they used 10 millimeter pipe. So they recommended a 20 degree delta T because if you tried to run water at a 10 degree delta T, you'd have such high head loss through that pipe that you would you you need a big freaking pump to do it. So typically, 10 is used 20 in certain ex- situations. Rick, you were raising your hand again. Well, no, I, I was just saying that. That's the product I have in my house is all. Uh, my comment is, in, in my particular system, I use a 30 degree delta T uh, in my radiant floor application because it's a above the floor remodel product, you know, that uses aluminum and I don't have a, a surface temperature profile issue. You know, the mm-hmm. house in Alaska I had was some gypsum and some slab on grade and uh, 
I can't tell you the difference between that. And again, I stretch my Delta way out on this product and it works just fine, um, you know, for what it's worth. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the companies in, uh, uh, in Europe use a 20 degree C for their Delta T on the radiant applications. And to me and you, that's 36 I'll, degrees. I'll, I'll put a couple of cents in that tone. Uh, yeah. I've got slab and I've got on the floor of my house here and I've done my. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I don't know. Dave, you're breaking up. Dave, you're breaking up. Oh, I'm coming back. There we go. Dave's not here, man. Can you hear me now? <laughs> we can hear you now. These damn Zoom parties. The, the damn Zoom parties out here. You got me back? Yep. Yes. Nothing? Yes. We can hear you, but you can't hear us. Okay. All right. I do a... Um, all right, I have a, uh, I designed my radiant floor, my slab at a 15 degree delta. Um, and I did that so I can go actually with longer loops installed in the house rather than keep into some of the shorter loops and less connections on my manifold. So I went to a 400 foot loops uh, with half inch pipe because I put a 15 degree delta in rather than a 10 degree delta. And it just made my install easier as I started mapping out the pipe uh, in my house here. Um, so i mean that's the beauty of knowing the math you know how do i how do i make it work to my advantage and it was the advantage uh -oh. it was <laughs> advantage of uh -oh. less connections on a manifold and feeding the pipe back to that space itself by playing with the delta t excellent excellent another question here from marco or marcelo hofer uh okay marcelo email me your email me uh the J O H B A R at takeocomfort.com and I'll I'll get you that uh I'll get you the that packet from uh, uh the heat loss packet if that's what you're after. If you want to see the presentation, it's on uh Mechanical Hub's uh, uh Mechanical Hub's uh, uh YouTube page, the actual presentation itself. All right. Let's see what else we have here. Anthony Reichow, my man Ant. Always size the boiler to the load of the home and then look at the radiation, whether it's rads or fin tube. Most old rads were designed for 140 degree water. Only way to increase output is hotter water or making each heat emitter a home run, says Richard McGrath. Very good advice. Always good advice from, from our man, Richard. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, oops. Do, 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 do. If, your house has more, if your house has more baseboard uh, or radiators than what is needed to heat the house and you match the boiler to meet the radiation, the boiler will be oversized. Yeah, absolutely. You want to meet, you'd meet, the, meet the load of the house. There we go. Uh, let's exactly. see what else we have here. It is doo, 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 doo. okay. Steam gets sized to the radiator. Yeah, you have to size a steam boiler to the radiators because that's just the way of steam. All right, that's the way of steam. Uh, here's Ken Ken Best. Can you comment about lower water temperature, boiler efficiency, and baseboard efficiency at lower temperature? Is there a point where you lose efficiency at water temperature in terms of losing output of baseboard? Is that what you're talking about, Ken? Go ahead, uh, Dave. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, there there is a point of diminishing returns. And I got to actually play around with that at my in-laws house. Um, we took that 47 year old boiler out. I put a nice new mod con on the wall and I did the heat loss, compared it to the baseboard output. And heck, the I started playing around with the, the output temperature of the boiler and I was able to set that the lowest that I was sending out to the house was around 125 degrees. Once I went below that, then it just didn't start to feel comfortable. It took too long to recover. Um, now, I got that advantage of playing around to see how it would work in a house. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's – that. I mean, if you've got that mod con, the colder the water, the more efficient it's going to be. You know, you send ice cubes back to that boiler is what you really want uh, in most points. Now, I mean, if we're looking at cast iron, another story. We don't want to really uh, have that thing sustaining uh, condensation below 140. So that's the way I look at it. Very good. It was kind of interesting watching watching Dave because I don't know if you guys saw it. He was talking and the and the, the words didn't match up. It was like Not watching an old kung, no, yeah, it's like watching an old kung fu movie. That was kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is your presentation downloadable like last week? Uh, again, this this program this program will be uh, archived on the YouTube uh, on on uh, uh, Mechanical Hub's YouTube. Um, page or youtube channel so you can want you'll be able to watch this i'm sure what they'll they'll have to take both both recordings and kind of merge them together because we had our little hiccup in the middle 
but yeah, uh, you'll be able to watch watch it again. Um, we don't have any handouts this week. Last week we had the heat loss handout. There were no handouts for this pres this this one particular one, so there won't be any anything you can you can you can download. Uh, Anthony Tosco, how you doing, Anthony? Uh, what does this say? Cast iron boilers. Let me just go down here. When switching from traditional cast iron boilers to mod cons, how many of us will utilize products like Furnox before introducing the new equipment? Just curious. That's a really good point. Um, whether whether it's Furnox or any of the other manufacturers out there, uh, can you guys speak to water treatment in boilers? Water treatment is it, it, it's 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 a fact of life now with these new boilers. Uh, Rick, I think you could probably speak speak very very authoritatively on it due to your past. Well, just, you know, what we would teach is is that if we've got an old system, we got a lot of stuff in there. And, I'll, you know, I used other words, but uh, uh, we it's got to be scrubbed. We want to put a cleaner in there. We want to clean it uh, based on that manufacturer's uh, recommendations uh, at a certain temperature for a certain period of time. And then we want to uh, flush that all out good and then add an inhibitor. And that inhibitor, then you can put the, the equipment uh, in. And, and you, you, you folks know there's plenty of isolation valves out there where you can you can uh, eliminate the new equipment and do the purging. You won't be able to heat it up so well, but you don't have to run that nasty water through that new equipment. But if you do a good job of isolation and flushing with, you know, boiler drains, et cetera. So, um, uh, yes, I, I, I speak to that uh, saying like that, that, I mean, it's not just the boiler manufacturers that are worried about their heat exchangers. It's us pump manufacturers are worried about our circulators and wet rotor conditions and that sort of thing. So uh, clean uh, uh, hydronic uh, fluid is a, is, is a must. And we know enough about it today that uh, and we have enough products available. We shouldn't be just uh, neglecting that. Right. There you go. Yeah. And, and uh, we're seeing also a lot of boiler manufacturers are not honoring warranties if they see that the heat exchanger wasn't clean if the heat exchanger failed because the water wasn't treated and that's a that's a very uncomfortable conversation you're going to have to have with your homeowner that this is not under warranty because i didn't treat the water so good new i don't know where that goes from there but that's not a comfortable uh comfortable discussion uh here's one from uh bill d'agostino um, what's the best approach when you have a greater domestic hot water demand than a heating demand with traditional cast iron boilers? Oh boy, Bill, you missed a great webinar yesterday on uh, tanks for the memories. If you go to Taco's website, um, uh, you can and look under Taco Tuesdays, you'll find a recording of tanks for the memories. But guys, what do you think? Go ahead, Dave. Oh, I'm, I, you know, I'm all about putting this thing on outdoor reset. All right, get that boiler and outdoor reset with a DHW um, with a uh, priority control, which is going to take that boiler and bring it back up to uh, to a higher temperature. So uh, take advantage of of getting an external reset controller and and modulate the water temperature. I mean, yeah, the boiler is going to be too big. You know, we we do, we do need to size for DHW loads nowadays, mm -hmm. and uh, so that becomes an issue, definitely. Um, and if we do the heat loss, we're going to see the numbers are lower than we've ever seen before um, or expected it to be. Expected, yeah. And, or, yeah, thought, yeah. 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 So what we thought it was going to be. And now the DHW load is larger. So if we can get that boiler on reset and when there's a DHW call, all right, let's get that thing up to high fire after that. So those are those are my thoughts in, in here in the East Coast. Right. And then you can you can put cat reset on a cast iron boiler. You just have a floor that you have to be cognizant of to make sure that boiler does not condense. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, do you there are ways to mitigate that to a degree. You can go with a larger tank for more standby storage. All right. And then you can also store the water at a higher temperature and temper down with a mixing valve at the tank that will make that tank even bigger. So there are ways to work within that uh, so you don't have to go, you know, like I have a 200,000 BTU boiler with a 50,000 BTU heating load. You know, maybe if if the domestic hot water load is that large, yeah, then maybe you have to. But uh, but uh, it's it's it, it, there are ways to work within that if the if the disparity isn't huge, you know, bigger tank would be one way to go about it. OK, very good. Excellent. Do you have to be careful with the aggressiveness of cleaners due to possibly opening up some potential leaks? Asks Anthony Tosco. Yeah, yeah, it, it, you could be opening a can of worms there, but that would be part of the documentation you have the owner sign. If you want me to take this job, 
I'm going to do it the way I feel is right. And this could lead to this, this, and this. And that's all signed off before you ever even open up the system. Yeah. Disclaimers are very important in, in this business. Yeah. I says, this is we weasel clause. Weasel clause is one way to look at it. Yes. It's a, it's and a, I see Anthony Reichow and I don't know what's going on in Dave's basement. answering. No, Dave's, so he may uh, know a little bit more than we do about this. Oh, uh, okay. Anthony might have something to say here. Where, where is Anthony? Uh, you can put it in, you can, you can, but it gets depleted. It may take longer to recover. Oh, wait, no, that's not, that's not, no, no, no. It depends on what you use. I guess, yeah, it depends on the product that you use. Some are more caustic than others. And then uh, you know, there are certain brands that, that will tell you they don't really affect the pipe. In fact, you know, the cleaner will do the, will do the cleaning. And then you put, then it also kind of puts a coating on the inside of the pipe to keep it clean. So, um, you know, there, 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 it depends on the chemicals you use. Absolutely. All righty. Let's see what else we have here. Boy, a lot of questions, guys. I love how the guys are. Uh, I love how you guys are um, uh, sticking with us. We still got 60 guys left. Uh, I like from from Priz. If you don't chemically clean the system, it's not clean. If you shower without soap, are you clean? <laughs> Depends on how hot the water is. Yeah, really. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, pressure testing a radiant system: air versus water. Uh, some Sanji, Sanji, I would, I used to always pressure test with air because you can hear a leak, you know, uh, you may not be able to find it quite as easy, but you can at least hear it or you can see the thing go down. If you pressure test with water, it, it, you got, you, and you have a leak, you got to clean up some water. So I, that's my opinion. You guys, I got a story for you. I had a guy, uh, come out, uh, to help, uh, fix some kinks early days we're talking alaska days so we're talking 25 30 years ago and uh so i was going to show him the good old you know kink method and show him. went out to a job and sure enough there's some uh return bins that are kinked and uh i didn't ask him any questions like i should have but i just said well i'm here to show him how to do this and i put uh i you know, took the ties off and i straightened that thing back out and i put a heat gun on it and i'm talking to him and showing him how to do it and we're going through this whole rigmarole and uh, next thing I know, I look down and this thing's ballooning out really big on me. And before I knew it, the damn thing blew up, sounded like a shotgun going off, blew sand in my face and in my eyes and before I was wearing glasses. And uh, so, oh God, no. lesson learned, make sure that you know if that thing's got pressure on it, pressure test with air versus hydrostatic so yeah that's all you know I if there's air in it before you put a heat gun to it there's the heat gun to it. You have to blow up like, like a balloon and watch out take run <laughs> with radiant systems do you believe in introducing a buffer tank uh yeah I, I i that was one of the things we were kind of foreshadowing with with micro zones when you have a lot of micro zones and the load of the of the smallest zone is smaller than the than the lowest BTU output of your modulating condensing boiler. Okay, if the BT if the load of the smallest zone is lower than the lowest firing rate of the boiler, uh, a buffer tank's a damn good idea. Yeah, you're get, you're basically adding mass to this to to reduce if not eliminate the likelihood of short cycling. In one of our later sessions, we're going to talk about how to size those tanks. But yeah, I, I absolutely, absolutely. Otherwise, you're planting a time bomb in somebody's house. That boiler is going to short cycle itself into an early grave, and you're going to have to answer for that. So absolutely, Anthony, absolutely uh, recommend a buffer tank when you have microzones like that. Record. Um, but nowadays, uh, based on knowing what that minimum load would be, that smallest zone, We've got equipment on the market that's 10 to 1. We got equipment that's 15 to 1 uh, for residential applications. And so now just understand what that low fire is, mm -hmm. compare that to that smaller load. So I'm not about adding more equipment to a system if it's not required. So you that's have to do point. the math and figure it out. You know, do and, the math and, and add that when you add and don't add when you don't. There you go. And that can certainly aid in your in your decision on what boiler to use. If you have that kind of those kind of micro loads, if you have a boiler that if there's a boiler that that's out there that that has the turn down ratio to work for you, then maybe that's that that's one of the determining factors. Right? Good point. That's a very good point. Uh, dum, 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 dum. Where are we at now? Boy, a lot of good questions. A lot of good questions. This you guys are awesome. I'm telling you. Uh, bum, 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 bum. 
uh, let's see, with newer ECM pumps having the ability to set delta T or change the pressure, no, they don't, Bill, uh, how, much, how much better is it than, than a traditional pump that just moves X amount of water at X feet ahead? Can you flow water too fast that you're not getting efficient heat? Asked Bill D'Agostino. Gentlemen? Uh, last part of the question again. Can you flow water too fast so you're not getting efficient heat? Uh, not, 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 not really. Well, as, as long as you have a delta T, you're getting you're getting heat transfer, right? Dave, Dave, where'd you go? Did you turn off? Or I think we I lost. Think Dave. Turned the lights off on him. <laughs> anyway, um, so so I I, I guess um, you can flow too much fluid in a system. And the main worry at, at that point in time is high velocities, velocity erosion, corrosion, banging zone valves, uh, a problematic noise, you know, things like that. Uh, I, I, again, um, the, the, one of the arguments a long time ago was saying, well, if I run the water too fast, it won't give time for the BTUs to jump off the train. Well, that, that's, that was a nice story when they were telling it. But if you look at like what John was showing earlier, when you look at anybody's baseboard, you, you know, uh, uh, output, they always list the one GPM and the four GPM. Just look, running four times more flow, does that give you less heat or does it give you more? And the answer always is more. More. Right. So that's that's kind of a, a wives tale and uh, who knows where it came from. Uh, but um, again, that, that that's not a, a license to over pump. I mean, we know enough nowadays and we have enough equipment available to us that we should never be over pumping and we should use, we should sharpen our pencil when we size that pump, et cetera, et cetera. All right. And, and to, to, to your first point there, Bill, about the uh, uh, delta T or delta P, this is, a, again, something we talk about an awful lot. We have a delta T ECM pump, the VT2218, which will vary its speed to maintain a fixed delta T or temperature difference within the system. So as, as zones open, the delta T would get wider. Uh, the sensors will pick it up and tell the pump to speed up. As zones close, the delta T gets smaller. The sensors tell the pump to slow down to try to maintain, let's say, a 20 degree delta T. It'll do the same thing as it gets colder outside. If I'm bopping along and I have a 20 degree delta T and it starts getting colder, colder, colder outside, well, the BTU load goes up. We're pulling more BTUs out of the pipe, out of the system. The delta T is going to get wider. The pump's going to giddy up and go a little bit faster as it gets as it gets colder out. A delta P pump, you said it, uh, the words you used, which are interesting, change the pressure. Uh, that's not exactly what they do. They react to pressure changes in order to maintain a pressure differential. All right. So if a zone valve opens, all right. Say the pump's pumpulating along. All right. And here you go. They're just pumpulating along and a zone valve opens, all right, that means there's less resistance against that impeller. That's a signal for the impeller to speed up, for the circulator to speed up. It's, it, there's less resistance, that means something's opened up, I'm gonna giddy up and go faster. Same thing happens if a, if a zone valve closes, there's more resistance against the impeller, that's a signal that hey, I don't need as much, more resistance, that means I can slow down. So that's kind of how, I, in a nutshell, where we're talking about with delta P. It doesn't change pressure. It reacts to changing pressure differentials. All righty, very good. Got a lot more discussions here. Guys, you guys are awesome with the questions. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, ba -bum -bum -bum. <laughs> we have an app for that. <laughs> right, there we go. Uh, let's see. Uh, your BT you needed will be less when you will be less when not at your design temp. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a 25,000 BTU zone at zero. I'm is, running a hard. Nope. David's David just he, he's just having a he's having a rough time down in that basement, man. He's in another world. I'm telling you, Dave. You're <laughs> you're you're like we're catching only pieces of what you're there saying, you and your video's all frozen up and everything. <laughs> he up. might not even be there anymore. It just might be a cardboard cutout. A 25,000 BTU zone at zero is a 6,750 BTU load zone at 50 degrees. There's no boiler that turns down that low unless you use a 50,000 BTU boiler. That says Anthony. So yeah, you, you, again, worthy worthy discussions to, to discuss. Yep, okay. depends on the load. Yep, it all depends on the load. Let's take another look here. Uh, ba -bum 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 -bum. Uh, these things come pretty fast. 
uh, recently moved and was surprised of how many homes are using the HWT or heating the basement, the hot water heater. Okay, the hot water tank for heating the basement floor. What's your thoughts on using that? So is it the same water heater that they're using for domestic hot water? Are they using that for radiant floor? That's a very common uh, and very controversial uh, application. Um, it works, you know, in most cases it works and works fine. Some local codes, this is something I never understood. There are some local codes that say, if you wish to use a water heater as a heat source for anything hydronic, radiant in particular, that water heater must also be used for domestic hot water. You have to feed at least one hot water fixture with that. There are other states that have a code that says, if you use your hot water heater, or your water heater, the hot water tank, to, in, to make hot water as well as use it for space heating, the inspector, it's written in the code, the inspector has the right to take you out in back of the house and beat you senseless with a two by four. You can't get more opposite than that, all right? And I don't know why. I mean, it works. I wouldn't do it, personally. I'd use maybe a heat exchanger off the water heater for some radiant floor. I'd do that, but I wouldn't use the same, but that's just me. A lot of other folks have used it and done it successfully and says, hey, you know, I, I had one guy tell me, oh, you guys talk about Legionella, Legionella. Where's the body count, okay? We don't see him stacking up dead bodies, so what's the problem here? I said, well, that's not the point. You know, there's, there's a, there are other points here, but again, what do you, what do, what are you, what do you guys see in your territories? Go ahead, Dave. Or not. <laughs> Rick, how about you? <laughs> uh, well, um, it, it's done quite a bit out west, actually, um, as, mostly with air handlers. You know, they're just teeing off and they're coming into an air handler like First Company or something along those lines, and and they're doing the heating system now. They could do a radiant ra ready basement that way, as long as all the components are NSF listed within that system, right? Uh, some people, uh, different areas uh, will require a, a, a purging uh, time. Uh, so after so many hours of off time, the pump comes on and it runs for, and it's just flushing. Uh, so you don't have a dead end. I personally don't agree with it. I think they should be kept separate, as you mentioned, with a heat exchanger. Uh, but it's being done. And um, some of the water heater manufacturers, uh, I've actually seen that they, it says it's listed for domestic heating as well as domestic water. So there's, a, there's an ANSI listing that the water heater manufacturer gives. And if it doesn't have that certain listing, then you can't do it. If it does, you can. Uh, I've seen it all over the place out west, so I, that's all I can speak to that. Yeah, I remember uh, I, I had a conversation with an inspector in Wisconsin, and and I was told to leave the job after that. But he he the the inspector said that this water heater has to feed at least one hot water fixture, or you can't use it for radiant for to to, to supply your radiant heat. And I said, well, why is that? Wait, where's the logic in that? Because everything I had heard previously was you know from from back east where I was from. They said, no, no, you can't do it, or we'll kill you. Um, the, out there, he was saying you had to, and I asked him, and he said exactly what you said. He he, he took the 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 the, the uh, installation and operation manual and showed it to me, and it says what's it, what does it say right here, pal? It says to be used for domestic hot water and space heating. It doesn't say or. It says yeah. and right yeah. there. So I had to ask him the obvious question, and the obvious question was, well then why, sir, do you allow this very same water heater to be installed throughout your jurisdiction? as only a water heater doesn't that go against what you just say never talk to an inspector like that because no. you're going to be asked to leave the job site yeah don't it, it did not work out well for me at all or the or the or the contractor and and he just and he stammered he said oh, well that was that's traditional use and i and rather than shut up i kept i doubled down on stupid all right and i said you just made that up right now didn't you <laughs> And then he said, sir, what, what company do you work for? Uh, I just want to get that name down. And, and that was the end of that. So, yeah, it, 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 there's no rhyme or reason. Or If you want logic to dictate, it's not in this discussion. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Regarding kickspace heaters uh, and on a two-pipe supply and return hydronic style system, if the main return and branch T's have asbestos, but not the branch lines, feed uh, not that, not the branch lines that feed the kickspace, what are your thoughts? <laughs> On, on if we use on if what are your thoughts if we did use a diverter flow type? Yeah, okay, Anthony, run you got to run that one by me again. 
uh, kick space heaters on a two pipe supply and return hydronic style system. I, well, I'll tell you what we used to do back in my old days with kick space heaters. If, we, if there was a zone of baseboard, we'd use a diverter T on that one zone and divert flow in the middle of that to the kick space heater. And that worked, that always worked just fine. I'm not sure if that's where you're going with this. Uh, on a two pipe system and you just need to get, you you need to, if you have some pipe there and you can put a diverter T without disturbing the asbestos, I think if that's what you're asking, uh, then then yeah, I think that would that would certainly work. Sure, you just got it. You're introducing pressure drop, but I think that would certainly make sense if I'm understanding your question correctly, Anthony. Rick, um, just uh, the thing is, a lot of those just have little snap action thermostats in them that say, "Hey, when I got water hot, then I turn the fan on." Now you might want to interrupt that with a, a thermostat, you know, because uh, again, that's all about zoning and overheating and that sort of thing. If you just want to let it run wild, that sounds like a doable thing to me. Very good, very good. Anthony Ranko says the X block is great for that application, uh, and he was talking about uh, water water heaters uh, using being used for heat in the uh, in rating floor. Yeah, the X pump block is is a Takeo product that uh, has a heat exchanger built in with a, with two pumps, and it's designed just for that application. And it's a terrific product, terrific product. All righty, what else do we have here? Uh, it's getting rough in Long Island. <laughs> Uh, what do you feel about a lot of micro zones compared to just a few zones in a house? Well, again, in my opinion, again, it, it depends on the needs of the house and the type of heating system you're putting in. Radiant tends to lend itself to a lot of micro zones, right? Radiant tends to lend itself to a lot of micro zones. Uh, you know, series loops of fin tube baseboard, not so much, you know, not so much. Uh, different types of heating systems, maybe not so much, but a radiant system throughout an entire house, which I got to believe we're not doing that much of anymore. I mean, I, uh, where, where the new houses are being built, it's kind of in non-heating areas. So I'm not sure how many houses are getting built with full radiant, but the ones that are, are going to be pretty special houses. And there's really no way to, no reason to skimp on, on zoning or anything like that. I, I, I don't know if that answers your question, Bill, let me know. Uh, there are a bunch of combi cores here in condo apart complexes uh, with first company air handlers for heating. Remember the, the combi core, that was the old Bradford Whitewater heater, right? Do they still sell that one with the heat exchanger built in? And there's a there's another good solution. I'm not sure if they still, do they still make them? Does anybody know? I mean, I haven't heard of a combi core and I don't know how long, okay? Uh, when I'm using, sure. yeah, I, I, I remember we, we had one in our old training room back in Minnesota, but yeah, I, I haven't seen one in Lord knows how long. Uh, there are a bunch, uh, no, so when using an insta-hot water heater for domestic and space heating, can you recommend a few fan coils that are approved for potable water use, asked Peter Trifonidis. I personally can't. Uh, I don't know, uh, Eric, if you're still on the line, if you have any input on that, uh, but no, I, 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 I'm not uh, up on, on, uh, on, spa on uh, fan coils. Uh, either of you two? Dave? No, I don't. I don't know the particular branch off the top of my head. Yeah, but well, I would already, think since we've already mentioned one. Uh, you know, a first company makes first company uh, right. little, little units that sit right next to water heaters, and you run water through. So the I would I would venture to guess those are NSF. Those, listed. yeah, those would be one of it. Yeah, you just want to look for an NSF listing on yeah. on on your water on your uh, on a fan coil. Absolutely. All righty, all righty. Best way to control a radiant system energy efficiently, is it outdoor reset or something else? I'd say it's a combination of a really, really efficient boiler and a well thought out control strategy. Uh, again, outdoor reset, if you're, if you're, if you're using a, if you're using a modulating condensing boiler, um, okay, so you have outdoor reset there. If you have a system that is a multi-temperature, multi-load system, for example, I have radiant in the slab in the basement, I have radiant in the uh, first floor in between the floor joists, joists, and maybe I have panel radiators or something else upstairs. So I have three different installation methods, three different water temperatures, realistically. Well, what you can do then is have the boiler make the water, you know, set the benchmark for the highest water temperature you're gonna need in the system. And then you can do a secondary reset with the two lower water temperatures using, let's say, a Takeo I valve or something like that. And now you're resetting off of the reset. So it may sound like it's overkill, but think about it. These two 
down below require lower water temperatures. When those are running, they're sending the lowest possible water temperatures back to that boiler. That boiler is going to really like that, and it's going to be really efficient. So don't think, a lot of times I say, well, I'm using a ModCon boiler. I'll just make everything the same temperature because it would be easier. Yes, it would, but there are benefits to resetting off the reset. That is uh, that is exactly my house there, John. Um, I, I have a three temp system. I've got in a ModCon boiler that's running the high temperature radiant at 145. And then I've got a plate system uh, that needs 120. And then I've got the slab at 105. And uh, I got two I valves in there and the high temps running off the boiler. And it is probably one of the best things going right now. So, and also a bunch of little zones in there too. So I'm looking at about eight zones in the house too. Excellent. So, Very good. Yeah. Good yeah. So I just, I, I, there's, I'm just so ecstatic uh, with the heating system. Modulate the world is <laughs> the way I like to think about it right now because that boiler is modulating, the mixing valves are modulating, and the circulators are modulating. So um, I got that thing so dialed in right now, it's, 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 it's not even funny. <laughs> That's very good. Very good. A lot of folks have chimed in that uh, combi cores are still available. All right, about 2500 bucks, but they're from Bradford White. Uh, Anthony Tossi says you should get a hobby, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> this is my hobby, I guess. I don't know. There you yeah. go. There you go. Yep. Would, would you have a webinar on passive house with heat pump and solar panels? Uh, that's pro it's out of our out of our uh, uh, wheelhouse, uh, Daniel. So we wouldn't put that on. I, I'm mechanical hub. I'm certain can 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 scrounge up some some experts on that that would give you a much better uh, input than than we than we conceivably could absolutely so they are uh, say what did i hear the word scrounge scrounge yeah they could scrounge yeah. up somebody okay uh, you think that that could be have a negative connotation <laughs> well i didn't mean it that way Dick, i gotta gone. bust your balls if i put can it, put it in can, couldn't you glean from the context <laughs> i got you but i hadn't used that word in a while but i used to use it a lot well, you were a scrounger from way back. There you go. <laughs> uh, we are in the process of building a 4,000 square foot shop and will most likely introduce radiant heat. Would Takeo be willing to donate some Takeo products? Uh, no, no, but we'd swap you for some pizza. Okay. There we go. There you go. If you guys have never been to, to Philadelphia, go to the Tosco Family Restaurant for some of the best pizza in the world. It is uh -huh. it will it, it will it will it will change your life this is life changing it's life altering pizza that that anthony can make and 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 no i don't want a cigar anthony okay there's another inside joke <laughs> in the cigar and a bad night on the on the on the water in rhode island it wasn't the cigar i got seasick all right you want yeah, to yeah, yeah. should we put it like that yeah 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 we'll swap it out for some pies okay anthony there you go uh, is uh, is Takeo coming out with the Dimplex heat pump? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure of the timetable on that, and I'm not sure how this COVID-19 thing has changed that timetable at all. Uh, it's a product we've shown at uh, we we showed at uh, AHR last this past year, and it's a product that we're moving forward with. But I can't tell you any more about it than that in terms of when that might be released or or what you know the the finer points on it. Do either of you two have any uh, further insight on that? Um, I do know we've got a couple of job sites up and running here in the East Coast. Um, so we're doing some beta tests. I think we've got three systems out there, um, all of them wildly different areas. So we really want to beat the heck out of it. So as far as I know, the guys are still moving forward with it and not slowing down with our heat pumps. So Good. I've got uh, one job in Connecticut, one job up in Toronto. Um, and I, I can't remember where the third one is just yet, but uh, they're, they're still plan on doing something again when that comes out i have no idea i haven't i haven't been to the factory since november um mm -hmm. and it's killing me right now um uh, <laughs> you know i live at that place and and i haven't been there in so long so uh people are going to forget who i am soon they've already forgot <laughs> <laughs> uh all righty gang any more questions uh it seems like we've kind of dried up a little bit guys this is great i'm got still 38 guys uh hanging out and 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 talk and shop and I, I, are the uh, is are the guys from uh, mechanical hub still with us? Or have you have you guys packed it in? <laughs> oh, I still got John Messenbrick. John's still with us, but the other guy said, "I got work to do. I got to go to bed. I'm I'm out of here." 
Let the Takeo guys go. <laughs> I'm still hanging around. Atta boy, John. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure how much of the question and answer stuff you're going to include. You're going to you're going to include in the in the on the on the YouTube page. But this has been kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. It's been really uh, it's good interaction and uh, great questions. Yeah, you got us a good group. And again, these 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 things. I don't. I can't speak for the other two guys, or maybe I can. This is fun as heck for us. I mean, we really enjoy this and being able to, 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 to talk nonstop. Again, like we said, it's the only, only marketable skill we have. So. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Oh, well, I've those been guys doing have other marketable skills. I don't. So I'm not. Well, all right then. We see people saying good night. So I, let's uh, let's uh, flip all the cards and we'll say good night as well to uh, everybody out there. Thank you for joining us and uh, enjoy a quarantini tonight, if you will. And uh, we will see you again next Wednesday night. Take care, y'all. Peace Thanks, out. Guys. See you guys. Bye -bye.